14 ships, 1,800 American soldiers. Their sights set on York, the British capital of Upper Canada. General Schaefe, commander of the British garrison, gives the order to intercept the Americans as they land. From his position, what the general can see is that the Americans are going to land down the lake shore. The people he sends are actually the Grenadiers of the 8th Regiment of Foot under Captain McNeil. And he sends them along as quickly as they can to make their way to the landing place to give him time to organize his forces and to cut off the American column as it comes towards them. The first wave of American soldiers comes ashore two kilometers west of the fort. And it's here in the woods that the British mean to cut them off as they land. Outnumbered by more than four to one, they know that this is where the battle for York will be won or lost. On the flank, the Grenadiers are supported by a small band of Mississauga and Ojibwe warriors. Like many native tribes in this war, they have rallied to the British cause, believing the British Empire to be their best defense against aggressive American expansion westward through their lands. But it's an alliance that is abhorrent to politicians in the States. Americans regarded the British as essentially race traders because here they are, they're white people, but they're making alliances with Indian peoples to stop American expansion and in the American view to promote these Indian attacks on American farm families. Uh, so there's a great deal of anger uh, in the United States, particularly among Republicans, toward the British for this Indian alliance. And no one in Upper Canada would feel the brunt of this anger more than men such as Major James Givens, the Indian superintendent. For the likes of him, the American invaders have sworn no mercy promising that any white man caught fighting alongside native warriors will face execution. At 7.20 a.m., the vanguard of the British Grenadiers engages with the first wave of the American landing force. wasn't decided on the open battlefield. It was decided in the woods. They don't just come up against the normal fighters they might have expected, blue-coated Americans with regular muskets, the smoothbore. Instead, it's Major Forsyth and his green-coated riflemen. Major Forsyth's men have a very bad reputation in the American army. They have no interest in discipline. They're very good at killing their opponents. His men are absolutely masters of their art. And their art is not volley firing. It's not standing up shoulder to shoulder, firing in a standard way. It's actually using cover. A major Forsyth men are wearing green uniforms, camouflage, and they're in woodland. And very importantly, they're armed not with smoothbore muskets, but with rifle weapons. They're crack shots. What Forsyth's men are doing is deliberately looking for targets. The person pointing, the person that everybody's looking at is clearly a senior man. Kill him and you cut off the head of the snake. Captain McNeil was well liked by his men. He led by example, he led from the front. So when they set off, he actually would have directed them, not saying, go there lads, go there lads, but follow me, getting in close. Unfortunately, as they do get close to the enemy, the way that he's behaving attracts the attention of Forsyth's riflemen. And a bullet through his brain ends his military career. Outgunned and outnumbered, the British regulars are now in desperate need of reinforcements from the militia under the command of local landowner Aeneas Shaw. As the British grenadiers and their native allies stare defeat in the face, 
Aeneas Shaw, local landowner and major general of the militia, now makes his own cool and calculated choice. With orders to act according to circumstances, he leads his men through the woods along what is now Queen Street. By coincidence or design, this also happens to be where his house is. Neither Shaw nor his militia will make an appearance on the battlefield, even though on the neighboring property at James Givens' house, casualties from the woods are beginning to stream in. And on the kitchen table, Givens' wife, a seamstress, must stitch their wounds. By midday, the battle in the woods is lost. The main body of the American army now advances on Fort York under the command of General Zebulon Pike, famous explorer of the American West and poster boy of the US Army. The American column is standing approximately half a kilometer to the west of the fort. Unknown to General Pike, the fort has now been largely abandoned by the British and in the woods to the north, the townsfolk of York are fleeing in panic. 